Janet introduced us to the man James. She told us that he was the half-brother of our Lord. Uh, she told us that he wasn't a Christian until after the resurrection. He did not believe until after Jesus had actually risen from the dead. He became the head of the church at Jerusalem, which when you read in early church history, he was a vital part, part of what was happening there in that early church. And then, of course, we are reaping the benefits of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit on James by his writing the five books that we're currently studying entitled uh, The Epistle of James. In lesson two, Coretta introduced us to the lovely subject of trials. Uh, unfortunately, those, those trials are not uh, if they come, but when they come, because we all have lived long enough to know that they are coming and we're going to have to endure them. However, James gives us four steps in dealing with trials. Do you remember any of those from Coretta's lesson two weeks ago? Do you remember what the first word was that she pointed out to us? Come on. <laughs> count. Remember it? Count. The scripture was counted all joy when you fall into various temptations. I don't want to do that. I want to gripe and complain. But that's not what James says. What was the second word? Anybody remember? Count. Know. Know that the trial of your faith worketh patience. The third word was let. Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And the fourth word was ask. Ask God for the wisdom that you need. And the verse was, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And it shall be given to him. So we have from lesson two, James teaching on how we are supposed to endure temptations. I'm sorry, trials. Now James throws in a whole nother aspect that we deal with as Christians, and that is in the area of temptations. I put as a definition on your sheet here, trials may be, notice the word may, trials may be sent by God to increase our faith and to bring us to a higher level of spiritual maturity. Well then, why may? That sounds perfectly reasonable, right? Unfortunately, look on the other side. What about temptations? Temptations are sent by Satan and enhanced by our own sinful nature, offering us an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. So instead of just looking at trials as tests sent by God to increase our faith, now we have a balance here. The trials may be tests or the trials may be temptations depending on how we respond. First Peter chapter 4 gives an, an excellent overview of some of the temptations that we are going to face as Christians. And in this list of three that he's made here, he tells us don't be surprised by difficulties when they come to test us. And actually in the verse it says fiery trials instead of my word difficulties there. So uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound so great. Don't be surprised by the fiery trials that are coming. So what do we do? What does Satan want us to do? What does our old sinful nature want us to do? Question God's love. We say, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? I don't understand. Why do I have all these difficulties? And so we fall into the temptation 
to question God's love for us. The second temptation that Peter writes about, he tells us to rejoice in the test of sharing Christ's sufferings. Now, that's kind of uh, two different words there. Rejoice, sufferings. We don't like that either. However, that's the command. That's the scriptural command here. But then temptation comes along and we're tempted to complain against God. We don't like the sharing of Christ's sufferings. That's not comfortable to us. And we say things like, Lord, if, if you really cared, I wouldn't be in this situation. And then the tendency comes becomes bitterness in our hearts and it, it we don't like to we don't like the idea of, of sharing in Christ's sufferings so we complain or the third step Peter says happily bear testing for taking insults slander misrepresentations scorn all those fall in that same category but instead the temptation comes along our sinful nature rises up and we say, I don't have to take this. No one's going to treat me this way. And we respond instead with anger and resentment and we resist God's will as it is given to us here in, in the verses from First Peter. God will send tests but he will not, he cannot send temptations. John MacArthur said, a temptation leads you to sin and makes you fall. A trial leads you to strength and makes you stand. So then trials are tests that reveal the genuineness and strength of your faith. So as long as we can stay on the left side of the page here, follow the instructions given to us by Peter on how to deal with these trials instead of giving in to Satan and our own sinful nature and questioning God's love, complaining against God and resisting God's will, then we will be okay. Remember Daniel in the Old Testament? Here, here's a young man who is living in the land of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. He, um, what, 15, 17 years old, probably a teenager, and his country is invaded by the forces of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar sends the forces into Judah, and not only is the country invaded, but many of the people of, of Judah are taken all the way back to Babylon as what we call them prisoners of war. And poor Daniel, this young man, finds himself now out of his homeland, strange foreign country, living in Nebuchadnezzar's palace and being trained to be a servant of Nebuchadnezzar. Now that's not a, a trial. Uh, kidnapped from your own home, so to speak, Strange land, don't know anybody in the language. And remember, Daniel is told, okay, you're going to be eating the king's meat and drinking the king's wine. And Daniel in chapter 1 verse 8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Daniel refused. He said, I am not going to defile myself. As we know, he was allowed to eat vegetables, drink water. At the end of 10 days, he was stronger and healthier and, healthier and better nourished than those who ate the king's meat and drank the king's wine. Now, is this a trial for Daniel? Absolutely. It's a trial of epic proportions what happened to this poor young man. But he withstood the trial. He didn't give in. He passed the test that revealed the genuineness and the strength of his faith. But what about the children of Israel? Not so with them. Remember, they had been led out of Egypt 
by Moses. They've traveled for some time, came to the Red Sea. Egyptians are chasing them. The Lord does the wonderful miracle of parting the waters of the Red Sea. They walk through on dry land. They're in a wilderness on the other side. They're safe from the Egyptians. In fact, the Bible says that not one Egyptian survived when those waters from the Red Sea came crashing down on them. But three days traveling in the wilderness on the other side of the Red Sea and there's no water. Now, we're not talking about, you know, 10 or 12 people here. The Bible says there were 600,000 men <coughs> plus women plus children plus uh, what the Bible calls a mixed multitude, a, a group of people that left Egypt and came along with the children of Is Israel when they left. That's a lot of water. They couldn't find any. For three days they searched for water and they could not find it. Could the Lord provide water for that many people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Then they come to Mara and they said, yay, there's water here. And of course it was bitter. In Exodus 15, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. But when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Now, here's another trial. This is a much larger trial than one man, Daniel, and now however many million of people here that are needing water. Of course, we know that the Lord did supply water for them, but not before the people <laughs> murmured against Moses, and ultimately their murmuring was against God. They had a trial. Instead of passing and succeeding through the trial, they sinned because they murmured against Moses and against God because they didn't trust him to meet their needs. Elizabeth George in her book, Growing in Wisdom and Faith, says, Remember, temptation in itself is not a sin. But the failure to resist temptation is. In Hebrews chapter 4, we have this beautiful verse about our Lord. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And in 1 Corinthians 10, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, Take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. John MacArthur, in his sermon on temptation, said, Every difficult thing that comes into my life either strengthens me because I obey God, stay confident in His care, and trusting in His power, so I grow. Or, I am tempted to doubt God, deny His word, disobey, and do what is expedient, and thus have I fallen into solicitation do evil. In our passage in James, James chapter 1 verses 13 through 16, James introduces the subject of temptation. We've been talking about trials in 2 through 12. Now he turns to, to address temptation. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. James is saying, stop saying that you're tempted of God. 
God can't be tempted of sin. He's holy. He has no capacity to do evil. Nothing can be presented to God as an inducement for him to do wrong. But what do we do? We don't want to blame ourselves, so we choose to blame God anyway. We say things like, well, God didn't make me strong enough to resist that temptation. Or we might say, well, God created me this way and He gave me these desires. Or, God gave me a boss that causes me to lose my temper. Or, well, you know, God put me in these circumstances, so uh, He's responsible for my failure to obey. Men alone are responsible for choosing to sin. Adam did this. He blamed God for his sin. In Genesis 3, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And Adam said, The woman who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. What did Adam say? <laughs> the woman who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. David Jeremiah comments, James emphasizes in verse 13 that it is not God who tempts us, but our own sinful desires. If we try to blame God or anyone else for falling prey to temptation, we create a false narrative. We must be willing to look in the mirror and say, the responsibility is mine. First John 1 John 1.5 This then is the message which we heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But then there is this verse in Romans For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would, would not, that I do. O oh, wretched man that I am! Matthew Henry in his commentary on James said, As God cannot be tempted with evil himself, so neither can he be a tempter of others. He cannot be a promoter of what is repugnant to his nature. In verse 14, James says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. This next paragraph comes straight from your book, so I know you've already read it, but I'd, I'd like to re-emphasize it. Drawn away carries with it the idea of baiting a trap. And enticed in the original Greek means to bait a hook. No animal is going to step into a trap and no fish will bite a naked hook. The idea is to hide the trap and the hook. Temptation always carries with it some bait that appeals to our natural desires. The bait not only attracts us, but it also hides the fact that yielding to the desire will eventually bring sorrow and punishment. So sin starts with our own lust. That's what James tells us. We just kind of look at the trap or 
Look at that pretty fishing lure. It's all nice, pretty, and decorated with colors and feathers and things. And we become enticed by the sin. We're captivated. We're fascinated. And we think about it. We think about that trap. We think about that lure. Sin is conceived. We step into the trap and it snaps shut or we take the bait. Sin is committed. And then we suffer the tragic consequences. Remember David? In 1 Samuel 11, And it came to pass at eventide that David arose from his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came unto him. So we see David committing the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. He is met by the Lord's prophet in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Can you imagine the prophet standing before David and saying those words? Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. What tragic consequences that David faced. Now we know from the scriptures that David repented. We know that he asked for forgiveness and the Lord did forgive him. But what happened? The baby that was conceived from his relationship with Bathsheba died. Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, lost his life in battle. David had two other sons, one named Amnon, who committed some very wicked acts and ended up dying a tragic death. His one son, Absalom, remember, led a rebellion against him to make himself the king and then died a very difficult, heart-rending death. So David faced, and these were only a few, David faced these these terrible consequences of his sin. How much better to look at Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Dr. Wearsby in our book and our lesson for today says, no matter what excuses we make, we have no one to blame for sin but ourselves. Our own desires lead us into temptation and to sin. God is not to blame. In James chapter 1, verse 15, James continues, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Remember Achan? Oh my, what a sad story here. Remember the children of Israel had just come off this fantastic victory over Jericho. Uh, there's just a little town called Ai. Joshua sent just a few, what, 3,000 soldiers to fight. And of course the men of Ai just beat them and chased them away and 36 Israelites were killed and Joshua was on his face before the Lord saying Lord what happened we had this victory at Jericho this amazing things you did and now this little old town here they've killed 36 of my men and chased the others away and the Lord said Joshua get up there is sin in the camp of Israel and through the process of elimination Joshua was led to meet Achan face to face. And in chapter 7, And Achan answered Joshua and said, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. 
when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold, 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Proverbs 27, 3, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Achan saw, Achan coveted, Achan took, Achan hid. And the results were the punishment of the Lord. He, he died a terrible death himself. But the Lord warns us, Let not sin reign therefore in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments as unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. James wraps up this section by saying six words, Do not err, my beloved brethren. J. Vernon McGee said, do not err. The word here means to wander, roam about, stray. It's like the little lost sheep the Lord Jesus told about, which the shepherd went out after. James is saying, don't wander. Don't think that somehow you can get by with sin. So James' warning in verses 13 through 16, always look ahead and see sin's hurt, heartache and consequences and Paul reminds us in Romans 12 abhor meaning detest hate despise abhor that which is evil cleave cling hold tightly to that which is good now it seems to me that at this point in our scripture James closes a door he closes a door on the darkness of sin, the darkness of temptation, the, the penalties of sin. And he opens another door in verses 17 and 18. And look at that new door. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Isn't that a beautiful verse to turn to after these depressing verses that we've been looking at, the, the warnings that James is giving us? And don't you love his terminology for God, the Father of lights? Isn't that a beautiful designation for God? And James is saying, we acknowledge that good gifts come from the Father of light. Vernon McGee says again, My friend, if you had a good gift, it came from him. Count your many blessings today. The sunshine, the rain, the cloudy day, the bright day, the green grass, the water you drink, the air you breathe. God gives good gifts, my friend. God is good. And Jesus tells us the same thing in Matthew. If ye then, being evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give good gifts to them that ask him? Well, we know that we have good gifts coming from the Father of lights. Now look at the second half of the verse. We acknowledge the character and the unchanging nature of the Father of lights. In her book, Growing in Wisdom and Faith, Elizabeth George tells us, God is also unchanging, immutable. Nature in the lights, the sun, moon, and stars, bring us seasons and days and years. Even the earth turns on its axis and revolves around the sun, casting shadows and changes of vision and angle. Now, ladies, look at this next sentence. How does it comfort you to know that your God never changes, never varies, never wavers. And 
How do you think that this truth about God, the fact of his unchanging nature, can help you go through testing and endure temptation? 1 John 1, 5, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And in Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Well, light coming from the sun and the moon and the stars, it varies from hour to hour, day to day, month to month. But the God who created those heavenly bodies never changes, never alters, never fluctuates. And in James chapter 18, 1 verse 18, he continues, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, or the gospel, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Begat means to procreate or generate offspring. So the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to bring about the miracle of the new birth. We can't earn this new birth. We certainly don't deserve it. It comes strictly from hearing and believing the Word of God. John 1, 12 and 13, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And in 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the first part of James' verse in 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. What, what an amazing blessing that he has bestowed upon us to make us his children. Now the second part of the verse, James says, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We don't have much familiarity with this term first fruits. It doesn't mean a lot to us. But in the Old Testament, those people knew it very well because they practiced the ritual of bringing the first fruits. In Leviticus 23, the Lord says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say to them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted of you. Now that's, that's kind of foreign to us. We don't do things exactly like that in, in the New Testament. But in Proverbs 3, 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. So the people that James was writing to, those first generation Christians, this would be a very familiar term to them. They have probably participated in the offering of the first fruits themselves. Remember when the harvest came in, God said, the best, the first that you, that you bring in from your harvest, you bundle that up, you package that up, you bring it to the temple, and you present it to me. And you do that in faith that the rest of the year a great harvest, a plenteous harvest will be coming in. You do this in faith, I'll take care of you and your family for the rest of this growing season so that they are well provided for. In the New Testament, now we understand what it was in the Old Testament and, and how it worked, but in the New Testament, what, what could James possibly mean? That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Well, I think probably, if you remember um, when Janet was telling us about James and who he was writing to, James is writing to Jewish believers who have fled Jerusalem because of persecution and they've spread out and they're living all throughout the Roman Empire at this time. I think that he is writing to say all those people now that are spread out 
are a kind of first fruits of his creatures and coming down through the centuries to follow there will be another great harvest of believers and that's us the word first fruits was also used in an analogy with Paul James used it in this circumstance that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures Paul takes this analogy and uses it in an entirely different way and I find these verses so beautiful and so exciting that I just had to put them in here. I just couldn't leave these out. Paul takes the analogy of the first fruits and he says in 1 Corinthians 15, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Christ is the firstfruits of the resurrection. And what about that bountiful harvest that's promised to come? Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. He's resurrected, and the, at the appointed time, our resurrection. In John chapter 11, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And then in John chapter 14, remember it starts off, Let not thy heart be let not your heart be troubled. And Jesus is talking with the disciples. And we get down to verse 19, and he tells the disciples, Because I live, ye shall live also. Christ the firstfruits, resurrection of believers to follow. David Jeremiah in his book on James, says James reminds us in verse 17 that in contrast to the evil enticements that come within us, all good gifts are from God who is over us. So the way to deal with temptation is to fill our minds with good things. Instead of fo focusing on the temptation itself, we focus on the one who has promised to give victory over that temptation. We meditate on his goodness, revel in his mercy and grace, and occupy every thought with his truth. Let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you for James teaching us about temptation and how he warns us. I thank you that you are the Father of lights who never changes, that you give good and perfect gifts. I thank you that one day all of us heard the word of truth and we believed. And I thank you for the first fruits of your creation, whether it be those people who lived in the Roman Empire days leading to the first fruits of all who would then be saved, or whether you're talking about the resurrection, whichever it is, Lord, I pray that you might apply your word to our hearts, be our teacher, keep us from sin, and we thank you again from these words from James. In your name I pray. Amen.